Our guest today is the president of the Chicago Transit Authority. He has served as general superintendent of the Chicago Park District. Our guest today, there we go, Park District, good for you. Where he did a fabulous job, I might add. Our guest today has also served twice as chief of staff to Mayor Richard M. Daley. He was elected to two terms as a commissioner, a reform commissioner, I might add, of the Cook County Board. Now there, give him a round of applause, well deserved. Our guest today is a graduate of Southern Illinois University and the University of Illinois College of Law. Ladies and gentlemen, Forrest Claypool. Forrest. All set. Thank you very much. Uh, real pleasure to be here, and thank you all for coming out. Thank you, Jay, and the City Club. Also wanted to acknowledge uh, my chairman, Terry Peterson, uh, who is with us today, as well as members of the CTA board, Alejandro Silva, John Bowman, Kevin Irvine, and Ashish Sen. Thank you for being here as well. Yeah. All right, thank you. Now, you. now you know what this presentation's about. So. You all remember these. So we have years and years and years of doomsday scenarios at the CTA, but in May of 2011, this gentleman was elected mayor of the city of Chicago, someone who had a deep and abiding interest in transit and understood its transformative power. As a congressman, he uh, led the fight to uh, rebuild the ground line at a time when people thought it should be shut down. The results have been amazing, the fastest growing line, community development, extraordinary benefits to our economy as well as our quality of life on the northwest side. But when we came into office, we faced a $277 million immediate deficit. Uh, that was added, $32 million was added to it this year with the, uh, the uh, automatic bumps from <clears throat> mandatory legislation in Springfield, the 2008 pension legislation. So our combined deficit for 2012-2013, which I spoke to the same august body uh, last year about, was uh, in, in the neighborhood of $309 million on a budget of $1.39 billion. So. How did we get here? What a mess. Years of structural deficits, doomsdays. Well, this didn't help. Uh, from 2008 to 2011, the CTA borrowed more than half a billion dollars just to pay the operating bills. This is not borrowing to invest in the future of the agency. This is not borrowing for capital expenses. This is borrowing just to pay the bills. Of course, this has been a fight for 30 years. Those of you who follow transit, um, you know, know it hurt it ad nauseum. I know John Gates has heard it ad nauseum for as long as he's been involved, the complaints about the 1983 funding formula shortchanging the CTA. Uh, the CTA is the workhorse of the regional system. We provide over half billion rides a day. We, I mean, half billion rides a year. We uh, have 160 connection points in the suburbs. We have direct service in 40 suburbs. Between 15 and 19 percent of all connections are suburban connections. It is the workhorse of the regional system. Uh, the 2008 pension legislation solved the, the before the recession. The um, CTA was the uh, guinea pig for pension reform. Um, and the legislature, uh, in, good, in good faith and with good intentions, did remedy the CTA's pensions, um, unlike many other agencies. Uh, and they passed revenue that they thought, uh, or at least some thought, would uh, cover those, those reforms. However, uh, the refor those, those reforms were passed just before the bottom fell out, Lehman Brothers and the economy. So you can see from this chart the uh, gap between the new revenues the legislature appropriated and the costs of the mandates under that pension legislation, which required the CTA to issue a pension bond fully funded immediately and um, also make actuarial additions each year based on the, the, the solvency of the fund. So the gap between the revenue and the mandates, which continue to grow each year, is more than $100 million. 
This is actually, you may re re think that the CTA's fare is $2.25, but in reality it's $1.60. That's the average because of federal and state mandates to provide free and discounted rides uh, to various, uh, various groups, both, uh, both poor and non-poor. Um, and the actual, that brings our average fare collection down to $1.60. So those mandates are in excess of $100 million a year as well. The state provides $28 million a year to offset part of the cost of those mandates. Uh, but those mandates uh, are not, obviously does not cover the full cost. The uh, recession's impact on public funding, you can see again the devastation of the Great Recession, um, and th those trends continue. Uh, inadequate capital f allocations, uh, the CTA has 72% of the current backlog, but we receive 58% of federal formula funding. And over the years, the borrowing that I showed you earlier, the half a billion dollars in borrowing, much of that was from the maintenance or capital fund of the CTA. And that resulted in a deteriorating uh, infrastructure. It resulted in a deteriorated service, which means less reliable bus and train service, slow, slower bus and train service, but also higher costs. Uh, because when you allow your infrastructure to deteriorate, the cost of maintaining and just keeping the, the thing going with Band-Aids also escalates. So that also has contributed to the financial decline of the CTA. <coughs> And um, the labor agreements, which were signed before the Great Recession, um, were also out of whack with the actual uh, revenue. You can see here the growth in labor costs and the labor structure costs of the CTA. The red line is the public funding. Um, and you can see the huge problem there, um, uh, especially since the Great Recession. And, and so something had to be done there. So to all these trends, the doomsday structural deficits, over a quarter billion dollar structural deficit, despite the massive borrowing, despite uh, non-union wage cuts, the un there's been a five-year wage freeze on the management and non-union workers at the CTA. In fact, wage cut because of furlough days. Uh, there was a fare increase in 2009, which is now worth 56 million. There was uh, deep service cuts, as you may recall, in 2010, 18% uh, on bus, 9% on rail, and there were 1,100 layoffs. And despite all those changes, there was still the $308 million deficit you see uh, there for some of the reasons I outlined earlier. So when the mayor came in and we came in and Chairman Peterson and I and the, and the board, what we faced was this deficit uh, and expiring union contracts and a new management team that we felt could bring reform and modernization to our practices. So we decided, and the RTA and Chairman Gates were, were helpful in this strategy, they said, we'll, let you, we'll buy you time, buy us a year. Buy us a year where we don't have to take the draconian steps that would be required if we had to balance this budget immediately. Because if we had to balance the budget immediately by assuming that our labor costs would remain the same, that our management costs would remain the same, then we would have had to both ha have significant fare increases and also massive cuts to service and massive layoffs, um, probably even bigger than the 2010 cuts. So we punted for a year. And as you can see here from this Crane's headline, they said we avoided doomsday for now. Now, we could have borrowed again. <laughs> but as Chairman Peterson said, Washington's broke, Springfield's broke, there's nowhere to go. So that really wasn't an option. Now, I did tell Terry he was wrong. I had one other option for him to consider to where we could go to borrow. <laughs> but. Terry didn't like the idea of presiding over the Pottersville Transit Authority. So, uh, so. so we cut. We cut positions. We, uh, to the consternation of our non-union workforce, we cut back on sick, sick and vacation benefits. We reduced contractual payments. We, um, we um, got the headcount down to the lowest in the CTA's history and also the lowest in terms of managerial to employee headcount. We also got an assist by growing ridership. Uh, in a slowly percolating, gradually recovering economy. And you can see this is a month, these are monthly totals you can see here. Uh, each month, the ridership uh, going up significantly, two and a half million dollars, two and a half million riders per month growth that we've been able to benefit from. But it still left $165 million deficit for 2013, and we had to figure out how to get there. We did it with management f reforms, more, as well as labor savings. And this is where our labor partners were, were key. Just in the nick of time, we were able to negotiate the, the, our agreements with our labor partners, the trades and the crafts and the iron workers, but 
Most importantly, the Amalgamated Transit Workers Union is our largest work union, which uh, employs our bus drivers, our mechanics, our rail operators, tracksmen, flagmen. The CTA had never in its history had a negotiated labor settlement with ATU. Uh, part of the problem with it is that ATU is a two-headed monster. I shouldn't say monster. It's a two-headed beast. It's rail. Um, <laughs> it's rail. I mean that very affectionately for the, the ATU people out there. So. It's got a rail side, the 308, and it's got a bus side, 241, and, and the, the constitution of the reunion requires that they both agree. So we could come to agreement on things with 241, we couldn't get 308, and, and so that would scuttle the deal. So I think you can see why it was so difficult over the years, particularly with uh, the acrimonious, uh, uh, difficult economics to get actual agreement. So binding arbitration was how things got done in the past. But this year we worked hard, our, and I got to give credit. Our labor partners really stood up. They worked with us, um, and we it was it was tough, but we came to a, the first ever negotiated agreement with ATU, and there were significant benefits to it. For them, it was jobs um, and and protection of service as well as for us. But we got more flexibility and less overtime, work rule reform, health care reform, and and restraint in wage growth, and that allowed us to protect good paying jobs with good benefits that you could raise a family on with a middle class lifestyle for many, many people. And that's very important, particularly these days. And we did our part as well. And having the extra year, which the RTA helped us get to, that extra year bought us time too. It bought us a year to get the labor reform, but it also bought us a year to, to basically see the fruits of our efforts, bringing mo modern management practices to the CTA to bear fruit. And those produced more than $50 million in savings to go with the labor savings. Now, if you read the recent headlines, you may have missed this, but we also froze the fares for our customers. Uh, it's uh, two, still two dollars and twenty-five cents for the uh, for rail, and it's two dollars for bus, um, and um, that stays the same. About half of our customers uh, pay, pay the pay the fares that, or buy ten, twelve, put, put money on the fare system or buy them individually, and those are still fro those are frozen. But we still had a gap, about a fifty-six million dollar gap to get there. So after making every single cut we could over 18 months to management, to make it as lean as possible, to see the fruits of reform. After, after organized labor stood up with us as a partner and helped us bend the cost curve to, to reduce the labor costs in our system, then and only then did we go to our customers and say, we need a little help from you in getting the rest of the way there. And the way we proposed that was through reductions and discounts on passes, 30-day passes, 7-day passes, 3 and one day. This, is, this, show, this chart shows you the monthly pass, the 30-day pass, compared to other price increases in the last decade. Uh, obviously, the price of gas is pretty extraordinary. The, the last one there is the current monthly pass, a 15% increase since 2002. In fact, the 30-day pass is, is cheaper today than it was in 1995. You can't really say that about other things, as you can see here, everything from a Big Mac to uh, Metro Monthly to the CTA base to loop parking, Cubs tickets, and the like. So it's a pretty, pretty good bargain. And you can see in the second graph here uh, that 33, that is what we're proposing to take it to, which still puts it very low. Here's the comparison to other cities. Chicago was just a buck behind Boston and having the, the largest and most generous discounts on passes. That's what the yellow line is. And with the proposed increases in passes, we are proposing that our discounts be reduced to the point where they're right in the middle of the pack nationally. And we'll probably be passed because New York has one in December as well. And that brings us into balance. With those changes, with uh, you know, uh, management, labor um, and the past, re and past discount reductions, plus all the hard work of the last 18 months, um, plus a growing ridership, we we're able to finally put the doomsday scenarios of the past behind us. So that's why we titled this, thank you. Thank you. That's why we titled this Moving Beyond Doomsday. So we want to move to the future of the CTA, to a modern, vibrant CTA. Now, you can see here, and these are projections, obviously, but you can see what, what these, these, these new structural changes mean. It means that our revenues and our expenses are essentially in line, but as time goes by, there's always going to be a little bit of a gap between uh, growth and expenses and revenue, which means we have to be more efficient each year. Private businesses do that every day. We need to do it as well, and government can do it. Just as we've made efficient gains in, in, in the last 18 months each year, we want to improve our management practices, do things a little better, a little more efficiently. And some of the changes I'll talk about in a moment are related to that, but that's to keep, as the years go by, is to keep that gap 
narrowing to, to, so we can keep the revenue and expenses in line. But this budget maintains our service levels, which is critical. Our, our, so many people depend on our service every single day to get to work, to find work, uh, to get through to their neighborhoods for work and for play. It maintains and protects that service, but also protects our plan to add, to add service where it's most needed at crush periods and rush hour on the majority of our system uh, to reduce crowding and provide comfort and more frequent service. It freezes the base and rail fare. We have a historic labor agreement that bends the cost curve. It allows us to continue to, to make management improvements and also add jobs. We're hiring 400 uh, new bus drivers, for example, uh, as part of the red line uh, renovation, which we're going to maintain in our system because of the growing demand. We stopped the transfer of capital, which was so, uh, own, so um, poisonous to the CTA in the long term, and allows us to continue to invest in the future. So, but when we faced this deficit originally, and, and rep reporters would ask me that this, we would, the mayor and I would announce various improvements, capital improvements in the system to modernize the system, and they would say, well, how can you do this when you got these deficits and everything else? And my answer was, you gotta, we gotta be able to chew gum and walk at the same time which is why I have this little boy here chewing gum and walking at the same time. <laughs> so we made improvements. One of those improvements you may have read about was our security camera system. We added 3,000 cameras, created a security network of 3,000 surveillance cameras in our system, and we added 50 additional police officers to the transit force, made a $10 million, $10 million investment in more police officers. And that has had a significant impact in our system. Uh, in 2012, from January to, to September, we've had a 23 to 25% decrease uh, in robberies and violent crimes on our system. Uh, thefts are still up, but they're, at a, they're at a, up at a fraction of the previous trend over the previous three years. So the cameras are working, the extra police effort is working, um, and security uh, was our top priority coming in. We want our passengers to feel safe on our system. We continue to make those investments and focus on security because safety is number one. We also invested in technology for convenience. Convenience is what's important to our customers as well. And part of the frustration is not knowing when the bus and train are gonna come. So we put bus tracker screens at our, at our uh, uh, bus stops as well as we're currently installing and we'll have by the end of the year all of our rail stations with the train trackers so people know exactly when the train is going to come in addition to being able to access this obviously on, um, on, our, um, uh, on our on phones and computers. And we invested, uh, we worked smarter too. Uh, we, we put all our trades crews and put them on SWAT teams to descend, sometimes with the contractors are supplementing them to come in and basically take over a station and completely repair everything in it, improve the lighting, painting, amenities, so that when people walked in it the next day, they thought it was almost a new station. They walk in, it's brighter, it's more comfortable, it's more clean, it's, it's something that uh, aesthetically feels safer, more secure, and it's a place you want to be. You can see the sort of the dark, dank, uh, before and after at the Logan Square station is one example. We've done a hundred of these stations in 2012. And you may have read about the Jeffrey Jump, which is a down payment on bus rapid transit. Uh, those customers are experiencing some of the faster times by using technology to jump queues, uh, dedicated lanes and the like, and that's something that uh, the mayor is very committed to. And I mentioned before the crowding reduction. Um, for too long, our customers have been treated like sardines. And if you're on one of our trains or buses at peak times, you may feel like one. Um, and so we created, uh, for the first time in a generation, a complete, with Northwestern University's Transportation Department, a complete r r rationalization of the system and look through, through it changing our schedules and our, and our, and our routes. Uh, but unlike the one 15 years ago, which was done by Booz Allen, um, which resulted only in cuts, uh, the elimination of about 10 bus routes and other changes. Our plan was to eliminate low ridership uh, bus routes and duplicative bus routes and then take all the money and reinvest it where it's needed the most, where basically to eliminate the sardine cans. So we're adding service at 70, for 76% of our customers. 2% of our customers will need to uh, use an, a, a, an adjacent service, either bus or rail, than the one they've used today. But 76% of our customers will get the benefit of added service on 48 bus routes, six rail lines, um, and uh, t 10 to 15% less crowding, more personal space, as well as more frequent service. So the buses and trains will come faster than they did before with at smaller intervals. Um, and this starts December the 16th. 
And you can see from the grid here, the red is what's eliminated, the green is what's added. You can see the scope and breadth of the, of the service improvements throughout the west, south, and north side. Now, of course, as I mentioned before, there were some proposed eliminations, which you know, are always controversial, um, but you periodically have to um, rationalize the system, otherwise you end up with this. This is uh, the old Lake Street bus service. You may notice that it goes up and down Lake Street, but you may notice that it runs under the L. <laughs> and this existed until 1997, and there were various attempts to change it, and it was always beaten back because change is hard, and, and obviously a lot of people preferred the bus to the train, but it was an, ex it was an example of a luxury that you, if you're really going to have a, a system that doesn't uh, overtax the taxpayers or that creates crowding that you have to deal with. And some of our changes are similar to the, to the Lake Street example. Because if you don't do it, you end up with this. You end up back with this. If you don't occasionally do the, like what we're doing with the uh, crowding reduction plan, you end up back with sardine cans and red ink. Our customers are treated like sardines because you're packing too little service where the demand is the greatest and you're asking the, and you have deficits or higher fares for the, for the paying customers. So the hard choices occasionally do have to be made. We believe we've made them. We believe that our board took the hard, tough look at it and, and made the hard decisions. But the benefits to the vast, vast majority of our customers are going to be very evident on December 16th going forward. Now, the mayor, as you saw the mayor's quote earlier, how much he understands the power of the system. And his brown line work in the Congress was, was op really opened his eyes to a lot of that. And he's a writer himself. The RTA has uh, looked, uh, you, know, you know, Joe Costello and, uh, and, and, Bill, and um, Mr. Gates are, have, have laid out very clearly that uh, the, the capital backlog of, uh, of, of the CTA as well as the other agencies, and it's significant. And you, we've seen the dangers of disinvestment. We talked about that earlier in terms of uh, service or uh, as well as uh, cost. Here's one example of why it also, you, well, you really don't save money by disinvesting in the system, at least in the long run. This is just an example of the maintenance cost that the CTA, uh, from based on the age of the bus fleet over the years, starting in 2003, and you can see how it climbs from about 32 million to over 50 million a year just in maintenance costs as the fleet ages, and then when the new buses come online, how that drops dramatically by tens of millions, and you can see how it's creeping back up again. Uh, and that's that's a classic example of how the capital investment not only improves service, but it also avoids these types of spikes in maintenance costs and allows you to lower those overall costs. Transit over the years, the CTA has gone, has gone, the speeds have gone down because of these disinvestments. You can see some of the time differentials there between 1990 and 2011. And that's reflected in the, our customers and how they behave as well. For example, um, the biggest increases in ridership over that 20-year period uh, were the greatest uh, one to three miles from the um, central business district, 44% 40, increase. At three to six miles from the central business district, 27.6. Six to nine miles, 3.1. And then when you got past nine miles from the central business district, minus 22.6. So speed does matter, and the revenue speeds have been, de have been declining. Um, that's why our goal is to remove slow zones, to improve the speed and the pace of our, our rail service, and make it more like this. One of those projects is Red Line South, which you may have heard. It's a five-month five line cut that starts in May and ends in October, and it will allow to cut 20 minutes off the daily commute of Southside customers. And the Southside, as Chairman Peterson likes to point out, the Southside Red was one of the few places with recent ridership decline because of these slow zones. And this, these improvements will dramatically increase the commuting experience for our customers, will allow them to have new trains, a facelift at the stations, and ADA accessibility, and much more reliable service. And I think as well, um, the, the, the extraordinary economic benefits of this project are, are significant. There's thousands of jobs that are created by these capital projects, but for years, obviously, there's been work on the south side of Chicago uh, and controversy over when that work doesn't translate into direct benefits for the community. Um, Chairman, Chairman Peterson has been out diligently and repeatedly, worked with us closely in this process so that we can ensure that the community that is uh, going through this dislocation for five months, that is taking shuttle buses and other less convenient forms of transportation while we do this work, reaps the economic benefit of this work as well with job opportunities, uh, contracting opportunities, 
work training opportunities. And um, uh, so I, the process through the two bid awards uh, and through working with the Urban League has been very, very positive in that regard. Uh, so we're going to remove slow zones as well on blue and, red, on, and brown. Those are underway in 2013. And this illustrates that we have already launched, uh, launched, get the, get the uh, metaphor there, uh, $2 billion in capital projects since Mayor Emanuel was elected. As you know, he, uh, I think Jim Warren, uh, from the, he used to write from the New York Times and Chicago Tribune and writes for a number of publications now, likes to refer to the mayor as the missile in his articles. So one reason is the speed by which he insists that things move. And I think the speed with which we've launched capital projects in the first 18 months of his administration is evident of that. Uh, among them are uh, working uh, through to purchase uh, the 5,000 series rail cars, which are coming online every day, uh, brand new, uh, roomier, smoother, quieter train cars to provide a better, more comfortable experience for our customers. We've launched a program to, to essentially, essentially create a brand new bus fleet over the next two to three years, um, both through new bus purchases, between five and 600 new buses, as well as the complete gut rehab and overhaul of about 1,200 of our other buses so that we will have as close to a brand new bus fleet and the comfort and convenience and reliability that offers to our customers as possible. But part of that is also investing in the unglamorous areas that were ignored in the past. Uh, to get those buses repaired on the street so that there aren't problems in service and buses not showing up and spiraling costs, we had to invest in our antiquated bus maintenance facilities. You've seen, if you ride north, you've seen the, what we call the seven dwarfs, the seven stations up north that are more than 100 years old that have fallen into deep disrepair. Uh, or we're just weeks away from the completion of the $100 million rehab of all those stations, which, as you can see here, significantly improved with concrete decking instead of rotting wood and other improvements and amenities. Uh, and the Wilson Station is an exciting project, which I believe will help transform Uptown, uh, both uh, uh, by moving the, uh, the viaducts and by really creating transit-oriented development opportunities in that, that community. Same goes for the 95th Street Terminal. For those of you who may have seen that, that bus and rail hub, which is extraordinarily inadequate, uh, uh, just, just horrible conditions of uh, crowding and um, really a lack of, there's a sa safety issues of pedestrians crossing bus paths and a lack of sort of modern amenities. We're creating a mayor manual with um, the help of um, uh, Secretary LaHood and the federal uh, grant making process. We have uh, received almost a, put, put together a package of almost a quarter billion dollars to completely create a modern transit hub on the, on the south side of Chicago, which will uh, benefit that, that bur burgeoning community for many years to come. Uh, Cermak Green Line for McCormick Place is also in the, on, in the plans, and the Washington Wabash Superstation that will combine and consolidate two loop stations with CDOT and the Gabe Klein and CDOT working very closely with us on both of these important, critical job-creating projects. And we have a five-year capital plan. Um, the $2 billion underway is part of a $4 billion capital plan that will bring the CTA to a state of good repair, or as, good, or as close to a state of good repair as we can be. It does not mean that every year after that you don't have to invest anymore. It means there's still hundreds of millions of dollars each year after that you have to continue to invest to, to maintain and protect that state of good repair. But we believe this will take us a long way towards that, towards that elusive, elusive goal. And you may ask, what does it matter? John Norquist I'm, is, is a guy I'm uh, fond of his uh, work. He wrote a, a wonderful book for any of you interested in urban planning or urban experience called The Wealth of Cities. He was a former mayor of Milwaukee. And his point is that cities have always driven human progress. And that's why cities matter and why cities are important. And the reason is the cities have scale and density that, it, that, that creates a, a powerful energy for forward movement. Uh, that brings people of great talent, creative energy, whether it's in the arts or commerce, uh, together. They want to be in proximity to each other to share ideas, to, to feed off each other, to build together. And that's why cities are so important. And cities to have the proper scale and density need mass transit. They need affordable, convenient, reliable, quality mass transit. Mass transit is the artery, the, or the arteries that make that system go. Which is why Mayor Emanuel said, to compete with other cities, to draw workers and businesses to Chicago, we need a strong and vibrant CTA. That's why we're investing in that future. That's why the mayor is investing in that future. That's why it was so critical to right the fiscal ship, to put the doomsdays behind us, to begin investing in the future in a modern CTA and not simply patching together the remnants of the past. So thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to tell our story and excited to be working ahead at the CTA. Slide. 
City Club B will be passing among you if you... Here, Marty, just give it to me. Glad to Late return? Okay. Forrest, this is from Joyce Saxon, Board of Governors. Uh, Apple sponsored the new beautiful Clybourne North uh, Avenue subway uh, station. Any chance of other firms volunteering to do so? Go ahead. We're actually working with uh, IMG um, right now in a process of uh, looking at opportunities like that, uh, discussions with corporate, potential corporate sponsors and others that might be willing to, uh, to make those types of, of investments or support the system uh, in exchange for some sort of recognition like the Apple Store, which I agree is a great example. So um, stay tuned on that one. I think you can handle these two questions for us. You handed in blank. <laughs> All right. I don't know. From State Controller Judy Bartopinka. Would you like to, former RTA board member, huh. would you like to see the RTA abolished and the CTA Metro Pace each on their own uh, organs? <laughs> or RTA absorbs the other three and runs the show? And you're elected official. Yeah. Uh, no to the latter, and then I'll talk to you privately about the first one after the <laughs> Uh, Pete Castellone, uh, who did not take my advice and write in big letters, do you think that the recent results of the national election will have any impact on federal funding for transportation in Chicago? <laughs> Eric, you want to handle that one? No, no. Yeah, sure do. Um, I think we saw the big partisan fight earlier this year uh, where uh, there was an attempt by the Re Republican Party to uh, significantly reduce the uh, uh, transit, federal support for transit. Um, uh, in fact, taking away uh, funding for, for example, we couldn't compete for bus grants and reducing rail funding and other things. So that fight actually, I got to give, you know, uh, some credit to the moderate Republicans who still uh, are still exist in this country because um, including several of the Republican incumbents who, who locally who were defeated in this last uh, election who really did stand up the, and, and, and fought back against Speaker Boehner on that. And, and Speaker Boehner had to actually retreat um, because, there, because there was a, a suburban Republican constituency that understood how valuable and important uh, uh, commuter rail and, tr and, and the connections to that rail were. So for example, Metra and Metra and the CTA here in the city. So uh, Congressman Bigger, Congressman Dold, for example, uh, were emblematic of those Republicans who stood up and had and pushed back so that actually that those attempts were unsuccessful. But having said that, I think the president's election and, and the retention of the Senate does give uh, the, the president a mandate of sorts to push for a more expansive, stimulative transit bill. As you may recall, the last transit bill was only a two-year bill, uh, which I believe we're probably six months or so into. So uh, usually they're five, six-year bills. Um, so I think you're going to see, particularly as part of the effort to jumpstart the economy, hopefully an effort to, uh, to, exp to put more of an investment into transit, given its job-creating potential and also the the impact it has on productivity within commerce itself, which I think is something that's not as well understood as others. People like John Norquist understand it, Mayor Emanuel understands it, but not everyone in Washington, unfortunately, understands it. Okay. Well, we have a lot of, no more questions, we have a lot here, so let's go a little, uh, the bullet round, uh, like the bullet train. Martha Jantro, how will sequestration if we go off the well-known cliff? I, I assume there will be a, RTAs planning for a train to make it easier to go off the cliff? Thank you. Uh, pretty slow crowd, if you <laughs> How will secret, how will secret, that word, uh, affect the uh, CTA plan, uh, revenue stream, and other projects? Uh, I, I can't 100% guarantee that it won't, but the latest iterations out of Washington that we're hearing is that because the gas tax funds transit is being treated as a user fee as opposed to something that would be sequestered under the spending cuts. That could obviously change at any time, but that's the intelligence that we're receiving. Jennifer Clark, Loyola University. Uh, how does the CTA work with CDOT to connect bikes and transit? I will spare my editorial comment on that. Go ahead. <laughs> well, as, as Gabe Klein is here knows, we worked uh, collaboratively on a couple of federal grants that allow us to help 
that you'll help us create um, intermodal centers that are rail stations that are both bus drop-offs, but also because because of what Gabe's doing, we'll now have significant bike a significant bike component where people can rent bikes and go throughout the city and drop them off other places. So it'll be truly be intermodal: bike, bus, rail. Allow people to take advantage of all three. And uh, and and that's something is you know Commissioner Klein is here. Uh, you know, something that he and the mayor have been working very hard on, as you can see from all the sort of the bike paths propping up everywhere. I can't help myself. Yeah, bicyclists on Michigan Avenue doing rush hour. Great idea. <laughs> Just great idea. Uh, this is from Greg Martinson. Oh, we, we, all, we all know the answer, but just make it for the few who don't. Tell us about Ventra. Sure. Uh, Ventra is just a, is our uh, brand name for a uh, new uh, smart card that will replace the Chicago card, but also have the uh, act, act like a credit card. You can use it really anywhere for retail purchases or, or other things. Uh, it's one of the investments in technology that I didn't mention um, that we are uh, moving toward and will and will actually implement in late 2013. At which point the old look dip cards for those of you who use them will go away. And instead, everything will be contactless. And uh, even those of, those of you who have a, a credit card, if you, if you look on the back of it, it has this little um, radio beam waves on it. It's already ready to go, which uh, which means you just you don't even need a. All you need is your credit card. If you want to get on a bus or train, you pull out your credit card, put it against the turnstile, beep, and you're in. Um, and for those who want to put passes on their venture card, they can do that as well. So it's replacing the old fare media with contactless media, providing a retail benefit to it as well. And so the Ventra signs you're seeing around the city are just the branding, beginning of the branding and recognition that we're doing in preparation for going to the fully contactless system in 2013. Yeah, I, we all knew that, right? Uh, yeah, okay. uh, Don Priest, status of O'Hare Express Service. Uh, the mayor you know, is, is, you know, uh, continues to be committed to faster service to O'Hare. Um, <laughs> You know, part of the planning process, obviously, the, is to look at that, and that's part of our planning for the next few years. Um, and um, it's something that we continue to invest a lot of time and energy in. How can we make those trains go faster? How can we make things better for tourists and others? So it's something that's on the planning agenda. It's, it's uh, not baked, but I, I think, uh, you know, obviously, it's, it's, it's the, the, the desire to continue to make trips to the airport faster is not, uh, did not stop with Mayor Daly. Mayor Emanuel has picked up the baton and is continuing to figure out ways we can do that. So. Three more quick questions. Uh, Jeff Riley, uh, can you take, can you talk more about the two other BRT plans? Mm -hmm. Sure. If you don't have an acronym around here, you don't make it. Yeah, and I should have uh, followed up with the Jeffrey Jump uh, thing to some of the plans, but they're a couple of years away. Uh, the CDOT with Gabe Kleins and the mayor actually have a, 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 a loop uh, connector bus rapid transit that's in a slightly faster um, a loop, no, no pun intended. And the, uh, we're working at CTA on a Western Corridor bus rapid transit, which is several years away, that would uh, connect from Irving Street, Irving um, all the way through the southern ends of the city on Western Avenue, which is also a connection point to, um, to all the various uh, rail connection points. The Ashland Avenue is another alternative for bus rapid transit out of the gate. Those are the experimental, the beginning processes. The lessons we learned from the Jeffrey Jump in terms of techno technology allocation and some of the other things will be applied in the planning process for those projects. But those are significant projects. Uh, that require federal assistance, and we're in the process of, of, of applying and, and going through the environmental analysis with the federal government. But in, within a number of years, you should see in the loop as well as on Western or Ashland Avenue a dedicated bus lane, dedicated boarding, um, uh, you know, faster buses, fewer stops, queue jumping technology where the buses essentially the lights stay open for the buses or or turn back to green faster for the buses, the ability to queue around traffic, things that should uh, cut in half the amount of time that a customer currently takes today to ride those buses. And, one, and just like our, some our capital investments that I didn't mention in the interest of time, but I will hear briefly, Part of our investments are to make those trains run faster. It's not just for convenience. It's also for, uh, it's, it's for, for service reliability and improvement and savings of cost. The faster our buses run, the faster our trains run, you need fewer of them, which is a savings to the bottom line. But the customer also benefits by getting more reliable, consistent service and, of course, less commuting time, less travel time. So they work in concert with one another. So just as we're investing in power, slow zone eradication, uh, to make our trains go faster, 
uh, and si improving our signal systems to make our trains go faster in the coming years. Through bus rapid transit, we hope to do the same thing. And, and sig something that Dr. Sen, for example, he's a former professor at the University of Illinois, transportation expert on our board, has talked about signal transportation, uh, prior prioritization of signals regardless of bus rapid transit, which is something we're working with CDOT on now too. So how do you continue to, how do you invest in making the signals on our system also uh, cue the buses, give them a head start. So there's, there's all kinds of technologies, there's all kinds of things we can do to improve the speed and reliability of both buses and trains. Helps the bottom line, helps our customers, and if we're going to meet the growing demand that we have and get people out of the gridlock, which will eventually come in a, in a dense urban environment that's growing, we have to have these public transit options and we have to do better than we're doing today. This will definitely take quick answers. Uh, Gail Anderson. Is there a run for governor in your future? No. Well, okay. Uh, to paraphrase Tip O'Neill, all transit is local. I just threw that in. Pearson in Michigan, across from Water Tower, does not have a, has a kiosk, but no CTA coming attractions going south. Why? Where's that in? Sorry. Pearson in Michigan, across from Water Tower Place. I wonder who asked that question. Um, I there every day catch the bus and I help people because that's my nature is helping people, right, Judy? I'm there. But Delaware has one, Superior has one, the busiest bus stop in all of Michigan Avenue doesn't have one. Have one of your guys look into it. We yeah, we will. That's a good answer. How, how about a round of applause after great job? Okay.